Hey there, Possum Rob here. So you don't hear a lot of these sci-fi channels talk about this much, but there have been a lot of rock songs that follow science fiction themes. The 70s and 80s in particular was full of them. So we're going to take a look at just some of the examples that are out there and see how they rate in the categories of sci-fi concept and how hard they rock. Now in this list I'm leaving out any song that was written specifically for a science fiction show or movie or was otherwise contracted or commissioned by some kind of sci-fi property. So as much as it rocks all of the faces all of the way off, Queen's Flash Gordon or Highlander stuff ain't going to be on the list for that reason. Rock versions of sci-fi teams also not on the list. So if you're one of the 14 people out there who love Miko's disco version of the Star Wars theme, you're going to be disappointed. Sorry about that. These have to be songs that the band came up with on their own, delving into the science fiction realm out of a genuine interest and creative compulsion. There's 10 of these things, plus some honorable mentions, so we ain't got a lot of time here. Strap in, crank your pig nose to 11, it's a blues riff and B, watch me for the changes and try to keep up, okay? Let's rock! Hey! So these are in no particular order. Though as usual, I'll save the best for last. This first song is a song that made me think of this whole thing here. So might as well kick off things with that. Europe, the final countdown. A lot of these sci-fi rock songs are apocalyptic, but these guys take it in an interesting direction. Not only does the earth suck now, but we're apparently evacuating. All of us. So that's interesting. We're leaving together, but still it's farewell, and maybe we'll come back to earth. Who can tell? That's good. Expectation management there. Maybe a while we're not making any promises. I guess there's no one to blame. Well, looks like we're choosing not to make any kind of statement at all here. It's not environmental, it's not nuclear war, it's just a kind of shit happens kind of thing. Interesting choice. We're leaving ground, leaving ground. Will things ever be the same again? Valid question. Okay, the second verse is where things start to break down, scientifically speaking. We're heading for Venus. We're doing what? Why? The Earth is so bad, Venus looks good in comparison? It's 900 degrees on that friggin' thing. The clouds are literally made of sulfuric acid. I guess that answers the question of whether we're coming back to Earth or not. Alright, moving on. And still we stand tall... Because maybe they've seen us. Who? Who's seen us? The Venusians? Did you guys learn astronomy from 50s Rocky Jones movies? This was the 80s. Cosmos was on the TV. But yeah, the Venusians. Perfect. And welcome us all. Yeah. I mean, why not, right? With so many light years to go. Light years? To Venus? Who's driving his spaceship, Stevie Wonder? You're talking 14 and a half light minutes at most. And that's if the orbits put the planets on opposite sides of the sun. Come on. I know there wasn't no Google back then, but libraries was still a thing. And things to be found, to be found. I'm sure that we all miss us so. All right. Yeah, very sad. So I'd love to be able to give this song a higher rating, but it's like they got Joey from Friends to write the lyrics here. This is terrible. In the category of science fiction concept, it gets one Spock. And that's only because I decided zero Spocks wasn't going to be a thing. But, goofy lyrics notwithstanding, this song rocks undeniably. It really does transcend the genre. Even people who don't like 80s hair metal rock out to this song. Mainly because it's got one of the most iconic synth riffs of all time. I mean, listen to that. So in the category of rock sauce, it gets five goats. A real min-max situation here. Sticks, Mr. Roboto. So this one ain't a surprise to anybody that is on the list. But what might be surprising to you is, is just how much more is behind this song than you probably thought. 
This song don't just come from the album Kilroy Was Here, but from the rock opera Kilroy Was Here. I mean, once you know it's a bona fide rock opera, it's kind of obvious in retrospect. So the whole show is about a future where a fascist and theocratic government has outlawed rock music. And the legendary Robert Orrin Charles Kilroy, and if you're a Scrabble person or something, you've probably noticed his initials spell out the word rock, is in prison for being a rock star. And he's going to fight the majority for musical morality, the MMM, and their leader, Dr. Everett Righteous, and bring rock music back to the people. It was 1982. Well, Kilroy defeats a robotic prison guard, hollows out the insides, and escapes wearing the robot's outer shell as a disguise. Pretending to be a robot named Mr. Roboto, apparently, he searches for someone who can help him with his mission, and he finds a young musician named Jonathan Chance, and then reveals to him that he is actually Kilroy. So you could totally be forgiven if you've never understood what the whole I'm Kilroy thing is about at the end of the song. Seems very important, but what the heck is he talking about? Now, the name came from that Kilroy was here graffiti meme that started in World War II. But that's where the relevance to that reference ends. Incidentally, relevance to the reference is a very good Yes album. Now, this whole thing came out of a huge movement in the late 70s and the whole 80s, where parents groups and politicians freaked out about rock music, witch hunting about backmasking and supposed demonic or immoral lyrics, and try to get everything censored saying it was poisoning the youth and indoctrinating them into immorality and Satan worship and all this nonsense. And using science fiction to address current cultural problems has been science fiction's bread and butter since time immemorial. I don't know why some people think this is some kind of new thing. So the sci-fi concept is really strong here, but the execution is just a tad cheesy. So this is going to get force box. Does this song rock? Oh yes it does. Weirdly complex musically too. I wouldn't say that it completely destroys, but it's a very solid jam, and this high note is a killer. Rock sauce, four modern goats. Still don't know what's up with that modern thing. I am the modern man. Elton John, Rocket Man. So a lot of people are surprised to find out that this is a science fiction song, even though the lyrics are pretty undeniable. Lyricist Bernie Taupin drew his inspiration largely from a short story of the same name by Ray Bradbury, about a time when space travel is so commonplace that astronauts aren't even considered heroes anymore. They're just regular working stiffs. Let's check out some lyrics. I miss the Earth so much, I miss my wife. It's lonely out in space on such a timeless flight. And yet some people still don't get this is a song about a spaceman. Weird, right? Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. It's better than Venus, though, right, Europe? In fact, it's cold as hell. And there's no one there to raise them if you did. I'm never sure I understand this line. If you did what? Raised your kids there? So you can't raise your kids there because if you raised your kids there, there wouldn't be anyone to raise your kids there? I'm not sure that actually made sense, but I'm afraid that if I try to go back and figure it out, I will start bleeding from my ears. In all this science, I don't understand. It's just my job five days a week, a rocket man. Yeah, see? Seems pretty clear now when you look at it, right? I mean, leave aside that it's literally called Rocket Man. This song talks about being in space, not being on Earth, and Mars being a crappy neighborhood. Having the roots of your story in Ray Bradbury is a heck of a great start, and the lyrics really sell the premise about the loneliness and mundanity of something we would think of today as pretty incredible. Sci-fi concept here is going to be a solid five spots. So, rock sauce. Like, do I ever see people rocking out to this song? Rarely. There was that one time the captain himself did a thing. She packed my bags. Last night, pre-flight, zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm going to be high. So yeah, that happened. But rocking out ain't necessarily what I mean when I'm talking about a rocking song. Elton John's music is brilliant, as usual, and meshes with Topin's lyrics perfectly, 
and really brings out that sense of melancholy. So the rock sauce is also going to be a solid five goats. What a perfect song. Blondie, Rapture. Yeah, I see your face right now. Stay with me here. So this one starts off like a run-of-the-mill Blondie song. A bit of an ethereal 70s, early 80s feel made all the more so by Debbie Harry's vocals. The first two verses are basically about being on a dance floor. Then things get really weird, really fast. First of all, it suddenly, without provocation, becomes a rap song. Yeah, you heard me. And Debbie's the one who's rapping. In fact, the song's name is meant to be a pun. Rapture. Get it? Very clever. So it's not only a rap, it's a rap about a Martian who comes to Earth and... Well, let's take a look at the lyrics, starting at the point where it gets all rappy. Fab Five Freddy told me everybody's fly. DJ spinning, I said, my, my. Friggin' Shakespeare over here. Flash is fast, Flash is cool. She's talking about Grandmaster Flash here. She and Blondie guitarist Chris Stein were friends with Freddie and Flash back in the day. In fact, Freddie shows up in the video for this song. As does Jean-Michel Basquiat, which I think plays a part later in the rap. I don't know. Let's continue. Francois c'est pas. Hashtag spontaneous French. Flash ain't no dude. Now, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. And you don't stop, sure shot, go out to the parking lot, and you get in your car and drive real far. There's a certain C-spot run quality to these lyrics. And you drive all night, and then you see a light, and it comes right down, and it lands on the ground. Now here's where you find out why it's on this list. And out comes a man from Mars. And you try to run, but he's got a gun. And he shoots you dead, and he eats your head. No joke here, this is a real song. And then you're in the man from Mars. That's basic anatomy right there. You're learning while you're listening to this thing. You go out at night eating cars because you're in the Martian, so now you are the Martian, and as we all know, Martians eat cars. You eat Cadillacs, Lincolns too, Mercuries, and Subaru. And you don't stop, you keep on eating cars. Then when there's no more cars, you go out at night and you eat up bars where the people meet face to face, dance cheek to cheek, one to one, man to man, taste toe to toe, don't move too slow, because the man from Mars is through with cars. He's eating bars. Yeah, wall to wall, door to door, hall to hall, he's going to eat them all. Rapture be pure, take a tour through the sewer, don't strain your brain, paint a train. Which I guess is where the whole Basquiat thing comes in, I don't know. You'll be singing in the rain, said don't stop to punk rock. Well, now you see what you want to be. Just have your party on TV because the man from Mars won't eat up bars where the TV's on. Good safety tip. Remember that, kids. Now he's gone back up to space where he won't have a hassle with the human race and you hip hop and you don't stop. This may be the first time that rhyme is made. It'll be made 700 more times before the decade is out. Just blast off, sure shot, because the man from Mars stopped eating cars and eating bars, and now he only eats guitars. And then she ends inexplicably with, get up. This is one of the weirdest songs ever. I mean, Alien Invasion is a staple of science fiction, so it's on decidedly solid ground starting out. But why the Mars guy is eating all the cars, I don't know. And when he eats all the cars in New York, apparently... He starts eating bars? Like, what does that even look like? Is he eating the building? Or just a part that's a bar, like taking a chunk out of the building like an apple? Or maybe just the actual bar itself, like the furniture. I don't understand what's going on here. An alien coming down to terrorize the city? Yeah, I can get behind that. There are some classics built on that premise. But this took it in a very, very weird direction. As weird as it is, though, it doesn't outright insult me. So I'm going to give this one two spots. Musically, it's pretty average. Debbie's vocals are always great, but I really didn't need to hear her trying to rap. I'm also not doing fractions, so in the rock sauce, we'll round this one up to three goats. But that's overvaluing just a tad. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Con Evil number nine. Now, I've always called it Con Evil number nine, but I don't know if that's correct. When it's spelled out, it's just Carnival 9 without no number sign, so who knows. But number 9 is what I've always said, so I'm sticking with that. 
Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, or ELP, are a progressive rock band, or prog rock for short. There's a lot of esoteric ins and outs regarding what prog rock actually means, but the end result is you get a lot of these bands bringing sci-fi and fantasy concepts into their music. And I think it's international law that in order to be considered prog rock, you gotta have at least one song that references J.R.R. Tolkien. Another staple of prog rock is the operatic 35-hour-long song in multiple movements, and Con Evil No. 9 ain't no exception. Told in three impressions, but since the first impression had to be split because it ran over the first side of the album and had to be continued on the second, it's really kind of four. Now, this is an epic story of the decline of civilization, the rise of the machines, a climactic conflict between man and machine, and an ending that is a little ambiguous as to who came out on top. This is ELP's most popular song on their most popular album, Brain Salad Surgery, with album art by H.R. Giga. And the whole thing tops out at 29 minutes and 37 seconds. Right? The first impression deals with the fall of man's civilization and how this strange circus emerges, presumably the titular Carnival, being a play on the word carnival. You paying attention there, Blondie? This is how you do it. The carnival's got some artifacts of the old world on display like a, quote, real blade of grass, along with some other decadent and less than savory exhibits, one of them involving a mule, another that makes extensive use of Vaseline. Not kidding here. If you've heard anything from this half-hour masterpiece, it's probably from this first impression. Namely, this line right here. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. The second impression is entirely instrumental, and the debate continues as to what this impression is actually depicting. But the third tells of a final conflict, ending with a showdown between the hero of the humans and what sounds like a Dalek from Doctor Who on the side of the machines. I mean, come on, it's British, and that's how computers sound in Britain, right? As we all know. And like I said, it's fuzzy on how things come out, which I kind of like. Plus, there's a lot of electric guitar in this one. It's pretty badass. Keith Emerson's Moog synthesizer Sorcery, Greg Lake's sharp and precise razor blade of a voice, and Carl Palmer doing the drum thing all come together to give a unique voice to a killer take on a familiar story. The story is well and artfully told, so yeah, this is a five spocker. Does it rock? It's half an hour long, so the whole thing doesn't rock exactly, but the parts that do rock like Gibraltar. This one's got all the goats too. Easy call. Six, come Sail Away. The only band with two songs on the list is back, with a less obvious entry, but I want you to go with me here. These are all probably familiar with the song, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the song by itself, but I want you to keep something in mind while we take a quick trip to the lyrics. And that's the movie Close Encounters. It's what always comes to my mind when I hear this song. You got somebody preparing for a new direction, set an open course for the virgin sea, fresh territory, and he's doing it in order to be free, free to face the life that's ahead of me. Now, every lyric sheet I've been able to find on this song says the next words are, on board, I'm the captain. But I've always heard them as, I'm more than a captain. And if that ain't what they really are, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say my version is better. In general, I always thought that meant he felt like he was being called to this voyage, so he's not just a captain, he's like more than that. He's like a prophet or a super captain or something. And that also works for the Close Encounters thing. So come along, we're looking for tomorrow, and I'll try, oh lord, I'll try to carry on. It's rough for him. He's thinking back to memories, some good, some bad. But we get to the part where he loses his family, right? We lived happily forever, so the story goes, but somehow we missed out on the pot of gold, right? We didn't make it. We'll try the best that we can, you and the kid going your way, me going out to the desert, to carry on. And the last bit, he makes it to Devil's Tower, and a gathering of angels appears above his head, and they sang to him this song of hope, and this is what they said. And what they said was this. <laughs> But then, the clincher, I thought that they were angels, but to my surprise, which it wasn't really a surprise in a movie, we climbed aboard their starship and headed for the skies, which is exactly what happens. Now, I don't care if I spoiled the movie for you with that, you should have already seen it. It's really good, 
Spielberg when he was still taking risks and working through his father issues with multi-million dollar blockbusters, you know, like you do. I'm not saying that Come Sail Away is literally about the movie Close Encounters. I'm just saying it matches up pretty well with the story of the movie. And it ends the same way, with an alien abduction, albeit a willing one, in both cases. Any song that inadvertently calls up imagery of a classic Spielberg science fiction movie is automatically on good ground with me, science fictionally speaking. It ain't perfect, but it's pretty doggone good. So I'm going to give it four spots. Rock Sauce. No question, this song rocks the house. And Dennis DeYoung brings another stratospheric high note just as Richard Dreyfuss has taken off in his ship. Five goats and a bucket of mashed potatoes. Rush, 2112. So, in the second of our two prog rock super songs, it's the year 2112. The place is the Solar Federation. Self-expression through music has been outlawed, and all music and other art is given to the people by the priests of the temples of Syrinx. The people aren't allowed to create their own, you see. But this one guy stumbles upon a guitar just laying around in a cave. And not only does it play pretty well, considering it's been laying around in a wet-ass cave for God knows how long, but this guy goes from zero to Alex Lifeson in record time. Discovering that he can make his own music and reasoning that if that's true, then everyone can make their own music and how awesome would that be? He takes his discovery to the priests over at the temples of Syrinx and jams out for them. Now, we've seen this kind of movie before and one would think that Cave Guitar Boy was buying an early ticket to renew in Carousel by doing this. But the priests don't whack him, they just kind of dismiss him. Beat it, kid, and take your wet, dirty Cave Guitar with you. Well, he goes away and has a vision of what the song calls the Elder Race, who the priests say were destroyed, but his vision says they just left, and one day they will return to tear down the temples. Guitar Boy goes back to his cave, and in his despair, punches his own ticket. The final act has the Elder Race coming back, wiping out the temples of Syrinx, and taking control of the Solar Federation. Despite how that sounds, it's supposedly a great thing, with freedom and liberty being restored and everyone able to make their own music, most of which I'm sure was pretty terrible. But they were happy, and that's the important part, right? So, like Mr. Roboto, we tell a story about music-based oppression and a rebellion against that oppression that brings back the rock. But whereas that was one song in a whole rock opera, 2112 tells the whole story beginning to end. Honestly, it could use some fleshing out. Both the Temples of Syrinx and the Elder Race are kind of laid on us without any kind of exposition. You just gotta go with it. It would be neat to see this story expanded into a full-blown show. But it's good stuff, and Neil Peart put a lot of thought into it. Five Spocks. Rock Sauce. Do I even have to explain how much this rocks? It's Rush. Which means everyone is hitting on all cylinders. And butts are getting kicked all over the place. Getty Lee's voice is enough for a maximum score by itself. I swear that guy could make David Frizzell's I'm gonna hire a wino to decorate our home blow the roof off. Five friggin' goats. Black Sabbath, Iron Man. So, needless to say, this ain't got nothing to do with Tony Stark. It started when Ozzy heard Tony Iommi's guitar riff and said it sounded like a, quote, big iron bloke walking about. Then Geezer Butler ran with that and came up with a story of a man who travels to the future, witnesses the destruction of the world, then comes back to warn everyone of the apocalypse. At some point, he gets turned into iron by what the song calls, quote, the great magnetic field, which I think I'm safe in saying is on dubious scientific ground, and is shunned and ridiculed by present society for his ravings about the future. He gets more and more bitter and vengeful about that, and in his vengeful rage, ends up causing the destruction he saw in his trip to the future. Now, if you just looked at the lyrics, you might not get this whole story, but Giza wrote a lot of this kind of plot into his lyrics. Leaving aside the guy turning into metal, since I think that's just so they can keep the song's title and it still makes sense, the rest of the plot is pretty darn cool. It's one of them ontological paradoxes, the self-fulfilling prophecy, which are always a lot of fun. Oh. What's really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? It's a fun story mechanic that I always enjoy seeing, and having it be a part of the plot of a Black Sabbath song is extra cool. 
I'm going to give this one four sparks, docking a spark for the out of left field ironing of the man there. <laughs> Rock sauce. There is literally no point in me saying anything here. It's Iron Man by Black Sabbath, five goats. And that's just because 700 goats isn't an option. Next song. Peter Schilling, Major Tom coming home. I'm trying to hold to the saving the best for last thing, so I end up with this situation here, where I'm talking about a thing that references another thing before I talk about the thing that the thing references. This also is a dead giveaway as to what number one is. Well, most of it. We'll get there. So Peter Schilling is a German New Wave guy, and what we would think of here in the States as a one-hit wonder. But this guy has 21 albums, the most recent one coming out in 2021. Crazy, right? Well, this is basically a retelling of the story of an astronaut that is launched into orbit and something happens and he can't make it back to Earth. It's a little more definite in the one that we're going to talk about after this, but it's a little fuzzy in this one as to what happens next. After ground control detects a problem in Tommy Boy's ship, they get what the song calls a final message from him, then nothing more. The final verse goes, Far beneath the ship, the world is mourning. They don't realize he's alive. No one understands, but Major Tom sees. Now the light commands, this is my home. I'm coming home. The this is my home part kind of throws some uncertainty into things there. I don't know what now the light commands means, but considering he's in space... Saying, this is my home, kind of sounds like he's resigned himself to spend the rest of his life in orbit, his new home. But then, I'm coming home, sounds like he ain't at home at the moment, so maybe home is Earth and he's going back. Of course, if something's wrong with his ship, that's going to be tough without ground control helping you. Which we know because his give my wife my love message was his final one. No way if Pete could have been a little clearer with his storytelling here. It's a fun little narrative, though, even though it's purposefully derivative, as opposed to, you know. All in all, I'm going to give this one three Spocks. Nothing terribly ambitious here, but it is fun. The tune is really catchy, and the sort of short, controlled bursts of lyrics works pretty well. I've always liked this song, and I always groove out to it when it shows up on a Spotify playlist. But I can't say it rocks to the tune of five or even four goats. This is more of a triple goat situation. That's still good, though. David Bowie, Space Oddity, Starman. To state the obvious here, this is the song the previous song is an homage to. And I'm sticking Starman on here too, because conceptually speaking, I really consider this to be kind of a two-parter. And just like how Come Sail Away brings Close Encounters to my mind, these songs will always make me think of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Which shouldn't be surprising because Space Oddity is a play on Space Odyssey. But anyway, we'll get to that. Peter Schilling's song was a lot more upbeat, but David Bowie brings a much more melancholy feel to the melody. Honestly, I feel stupid trying to visualize just how amazing this song is musically, so let's stick to the science fiction aspect. I feel a little more on solid ground there than talking about the 134s and the Mixolydians and the whatnot. So Major Tom goes up in space, and seeing things from that perspective changes his whole worldview, or universe view, and he feels very small and insignificant, even in the light of the fact that he's a hero and celebrity now back on Earth, with the papers wanting to know whose shirt he wears and all that. But as we already know from the other song, something goes wrong, and this time it's pretty obvious Major Tom ain't coming home. Ground Control loses contact, asks can you hear me Major Tom a few times, but gets no response. And the final chorus, Major Tom says he's far above the moon now, so it sounds like he's a little off course there, maybe heading out into space. So what happens in 2001? The alien intelligence calls to humanity from the monolith out by Jupiter. Due to certain circumstances and a computer that goes a little hinky, one guy makes it there and goes through the monolith in an EVA pod, a monolith that is really a stargate that can take him to where the alien intelligence is. He's literally floating in a tin can, going out into the unknown, just like Major Tom. Well, Dave Bowman, the guy from 2001, in case you ain't seen it, makes it to an alien planet where there's a little house set up for him to grow old in. See, the aliens need him basically to die in order to have the final monolith cause him to ascend and become the star child. 
If you haven't seen this movie, I have no doubt you're lost as hell right now. But trust me, you're still pretty lost even if you have seen the movie. Anyways, at the end of 2001, we see Earth again and we see that the star child, who is Dave Bowman, is there. So he has returned to Earth in a new form, presumably to lead them to a new consciousness and an elevated state of being. I think. There's college courses on this movie, so I don't know. So in my headcanon, Major Tom goes out into space just like Dave did. And we don't really see what happens to him, but lo and behold, here comes Ziggy Stardust. And he's got one of them heightened states of consciousness that he wants to bring us, but he's worried it'll blow our minds. So yeah, I think like Dave Bowman becomes the star child, I think Major Tom becomes Ziggy Stardust. Only instead of whatever the star child is selling, Ziggy's bringing the rock and wants all the children to boogie. Which I think is a better path. Starman is a phenomenal song in its own right, with that killer octave jump on the word Starman evoking the same jump on the word somewhere in Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And the whole Ziggy Stardust thing continues through the whole album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, and goes all the way to Jupiter and beyond the infinite. I don't know if Bowie intended anyone to think that Major Tom actually became Ziggy Stardust, but I think it's a great fan theory and I'm sticking to it. What is there to talk about here? I love the story of these two songs on their own, and connecting them together makes me love them even more. I can feel Major Tom's melancholy and even a little frustration at Ground Control's obsession over what must seem like minutia when you're up in that tin can staring at infinity. I mean, who gives a rat's ass about a protein pill at a time like that, right? And Starman is much more optimistic, bringing the rock and otherworldly boogie to the people of Earth so we can all dance together in harmony. What's not to love about that? Each of these songs alone, and certainly taken together, get five enthusiastic Spocks. As enthusiastic as Spock gets, anyway. Jim! Again, I'm not really qualified to speak to the musical genius of David Bowie, but honestly, David Bowie's genius is a universal constant that can't really be debated any more than what the speed of light is can be. Which is to say, only people with a massively esoteric understanding of the subject matter can even make an opening statement in that kind of debate. So five star goats on this one, for sure. So there's your top ten list. Now before we get into the honorable mentions, I gotta share this thing I found doing research for this thing. You remember we talked briefly about William Shatner's smoking spoken word performance of Rocket Man? Well, believe it or not, he released a whole album in 2011 of covers of spacey type songs along the same lines, including four of the songs on this very list, the aforementioned Rocket Man, both Space Oddity and Major Tom Coming Home, and My Hand of God. Iron Man. Yep, Bill Shatner covers Black Sabbath. The album is called Seeking Major Tom, and all I'm going to say is it's worth checking out. Take that as you will. All right, so two honorable mentions here. They don't make the list because they're not really rock songs. One is a country song, and the other is a folk song, but from an unexpected band. First, you got The Highwayman by country supergroup The Highwaymen which was made up of Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, Willie Nelson, and Johnny Cash. Real power team there if you're into the country music. It's about an immortal that goes through history being a highwayman, which, if you don't know, is a robber guy from them powdered wig times, hitting folks while they're traveling. And then he's a sailor on like a kind of Moby Dick kind of ship. And then he works on what sounds like a Hoover-type dam. And then he's on a starship, exploring the universe, looking for a planet to retire on. It's a pretty neat song. I'm not much for your country music, but this one I like. The other one is called 39. It's a real folky acoustic guitar strumming song about a crew that leaves Earth to set up a colony on another planet. And when they get back after a year, because of time dilation, a hundred years has passed on Earth. They left in 39 and they came back in 39, but they ain't the same 39. It's kind of depressing because the guy who's singing the song left his wife at home. And now all he's got is a descendant of his whose eyes resemble his lost wives. It's pretty rough. So who's singing this folk song about time dilation? You'd think it's something a guy with a PhD in astrophysics would write. 
And you'd be correct. It was written by Dr. Brian May and performed by Queen. Rock band, not a rock song. But it had to go on the honorable mention list. I didn't even know this song existed until I started trying to compile this list. But I love this thing. Great song. Check it out if you ain't heard it before. So there you have it. Ten science fiction rock songs. Some of them great. Some of them not as great. But all of them fun in their own way. Do you have a science fiction rock song that you dig and wasn't on the list? Let me know in the comments down there. I discovered a few songs I wasn't familiar with doing this thing. And I'd love to discover some more. If you liked me doing the Casey Kasem thing and exploring some sci-fi jams, reach down there and like that thumbs up button so as I know you dug it. And while you're down there, hit that subscribe button too so as you don't miss any of the amazing stuff I'm laying down over here. Don't know which is going to be next, but I got a comment response video I'm working on, and also in honor of the dropping of the trailer for the new Indiana Jones movie a few weeks ago, whenever that was, I got one where we're going to take a look at just why Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was a steaming hot pile of CGI monkey shit. That ought to be fun, right? So stick around, and remember, possum friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, alright? Later. <laughs>